Yeah. They're very similar that way. Like Brandon and and Brett when we when he was with us and, and Emil, the way they are determined and just perfectionists and how they approach their craft. Obviously with, with Loris the last few years, he's pushed us to be better at what we do. Um the staff from track, everybody, our partners, he's always pushing and trying to like progress. I mean, it's, it's, it is hard to keep the best athletes in the world, you know, and it's sometimes it doesn't go in your, on your favor, but, um, Andrew Shandro, welcome to the downtime podcast, man. Thanks for taking some time out of your schedule for a chat. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me, Chris. Yeah. So we've not had you on the show before. Let's get a bit of background. Um, first off, whereabouts did you grow up? You were in, you grew up in uh, in Canada, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm born and raised on the North Shore of Vancouver, so North Vancouver, and we're still uh-huh. here. We're still here now, thankfully, yeah. fortunate. Nice. And was was skiing a thing for you growing up? Then it seems to be a lot of people from that area get into the ski side and ski racing. Yeah, um, my folks have had a place in Whistler back since the 70s so we were fortunate as kids we got to go to whistler weekends and and ski and um so we grew up skiing i grew up ski racing as a kid and um yeah we've been kind of half my life i would say is spent in whistler over the years amazing how serious was the ski racing side of things for you was it just the the thing that everyone does or were you kind of competitive no i mean i was i wasn't that serious. you know provincially serious but you know i didn't race that long i only raced till i was 14 or 15 so i I didn't race that long um but i met my wife ski racing when we were kids and then back then there's there's two mountains there's whistler and there's black home there used to be two different um ski race clubs so there's competition you know now it's just one um but yeah we met as kids we were like 13 14 i met met christine skiing back in the day yeah that's amazing <laughs> a while. yeah that's yeah. that's incredible yeah so how how does bikes come into your life i mean i'm guessing you rode bikes as a kid but when do mountain bikes start to feature because i'm guessing you're sort of similar age to me in that mountain bikes was a developing thing when we were young right yeah um my dad was always into biking he was into road riding so you know wherever way back then and so we we had mountain bikes around my first mountain bike was probably in 86 86 was probably my first mountain bike and so on we were up at whistler in the summers and we would just my brother and i we'd ride around the block push our bike or ride our bikes halfway up um black Hill mountain and then rip back down on the fire roads so it was really just fire roads and like gravel paths you know that's kind of when it started but yeah it was probably 86 was probably when i first got my mountain bike or yeah, first mountain pretty bike. Early yeah. Tours. yeah what was that first bike it was an ashiki bushwhacker <laughs> and what so fully rigid oh like yeah, yeah, brakes yeah, yeah. And all that stuff yeah oh yeah fully yeah. rigid you know the top bar shifter mount things or whatever yeah yeah, yeah. no i still have it that's cool and what yeah. was there was there racing then like in the in the area you grew up what was going on um so no not not in 86 80 but it's kind of started shortly thereafter um i started racing bikes in grade 12 so i was like 89 80 it's kind of when i started racing bikes and then back then there wasn't downhill was really in the infancy so it was everything was xc racing so um well there was a little bit of downhill but we raced xc to start and then i kind of transitioned and then there were races um in whistler in the early days and there was these these called like the brc challenge and can-am challenge we'd race xc on a saturday you'd ride dual solemn you'd do a hill climb and a downhill all on the same bike and on the same day right or over the well same over the over the course of the weekend you know but sometimes yeah you do the hill climb and then uh, get to the top of the mountain, have a snack, and then race downhill on the same bike. That's awesome. And was it the downhill side of it that stood out to you? Were you kind of naturally drawn to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, back then, most people, if you're into racing, you kind of did everything. Like, so I, I did the same. I, I even road raced a little bit in the early, about a little bit later, but I, so I raced XC and road raced. Um, but I gravitated towards downhill. 
um the speed the kind of the adrenaline inside of it and i i i did well at a higher level early and then so then it's kind of a natural progression for me where i just went all in on downhill yeah well so how old were you when you kind of decided to go all in really start pushing on, on maybe making it more than just yeah a hobby? like yeah like kind of transition from being a hobby to like oh i think i can actually maybe make this my job uh yeah. that would have been about 90 89 90 like actually after i graduated traveled around a little bit after and i remember being on that trip i was i, I went tree planting that that summer to kind of pay for a trip to go away and i traveled around with a buddy and went all over the place um and then i remember on that trip i was just like okay i'm gonna when i get back i'm gonna go all in and see if i can actually do this and so that that would have been about 90 i guess yeah yeah what gave you the confidence then to to believe that it, that was possible because i think a lot of people will struggle to make that leap from like i enjoy racing bikes to I think if I commit to this, I've got a potential career here. Yeah, or, you know, you I don't know, like more. I don't like completely remember. I mean, I think it was just like, why not? You okay. Know? And I had support from my parents. My dad was totally into it. He was keen. He was like, "Yeah, go for it." Um, my mom was probably a little bit more worried more than anything, right? But um, yeah, it was. I think it was really just like you know what? I felt like I had some natural ability let's give it a crack and then you know in those early days that was really when it was really starting to come like take off downhill you know like 90 91 and so um i had some good support from some local sponsors like very little support but support you know so it all helped and um we had a world cup back in in saint anne back in the early 90s and those were kind of the first big races in canada um and so yeah that's kind of where it started yeah and you beat john tomac like fairly early in your career yeah i mean that was sort of the highlight deal. like i i won a few big races couple world cups at saint anne actually and tomac was the year and that would have been 92 i think 92 yeah and and for us growing up i mean he was our hero he was like the man and everybody knew tomac you know so to beat him um I would say that was sort of the catalyst to sort of my career to some degree um was having johnny t beside you on the podium was pretty special <laughs> yeah that's yeah. pretty impressive yeah um, and i guess kind of the first canadian to be successful on the world stage in downhill is that fair i would say that's fair yeah i i was the first one to sort of win at a world cup level um and that was like i said early 90s and then there's some some other guys racing and dave watson there's a few guys that had some success but and then it sort of transitioned you know as we get into the 90s and dustin uh, adams had some success and and then of course stevie and then it carries on from there and so yeah yeah two world cup wins but they both in monson and they were what what was it about that track? Was it just like, is there a home advantage, or are you more? Nah, you know what? I, I I can't really say. I mean, I probably just was. You're you know you're so new. You have no expectations. You just go in feeling confident. You don't really know the scene that well. Um, you know, it's hard to know. You know, I kind of look back at it. I mean, I had some success in my career after through the '90s and through World Cups. I didn't win anything else. I mean, I won some nationals and some north american races and you know did well some norba events but um yeah it's hard to know i don't know i just there's something about that i that i like you know yeah fair yeah. and you've got um you've got some x games experience as well yeah <laughs> i do well on snow you know yeah yeah we joke about this quite a bit x games on snow and obviously with the introduction of snow mountain biking and this past winter or this winter just a month or so ago um yeah i mean it was fun we we looked at it as a novelty event um you're riding on snow with spike tires it's unpredictable but it was fun i had success at it i think probably because of my ski background okay um so i won the x games in 99 on the you know the dual solemn snow event and just being probably comfortable with snow and uh the speed of it and how to read the terrain probably helped me but 
in all honesty, it was, you know, you're on snow and mountain bikes. That's not really where it's where we want it to be. You know, it was a, it was a novelty event really. So, yeah. Were yeah. you surprised to see that as a world, world championship event this year? I, like, I, I was, a few I mean, yeah, I mean, for sure I was, I, I, you know, again, I have experience with it and it's, it's, okay. you know, I don't think it's where the sport needs to be in all honesty, like, like the, the racing and currently right now and and you know it's at such a high level it's phenomenal to watch the athletes or what they're doing and the equipment and and on snow it's it's sort of like you know you're sliding around with spike tires and and to maintain a proper track on snow takes an incredible amount of work like in terms of you know watering it salting it freezing and all that kind of stuff so it's not really a sustainable thing to have snow racing at a high level in yeah. my opinion oh. Yeah. I was kind of surprised they didn't go for more of like a border cross style, like four riders with yeah. jumps and would have been at least a bit more interesting to watch. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't I'm not even, I don't even speculate why they're trying to do this, to be honest. It's hard to know, yeah. but um, strange one. I yeah. Fair play. Yeah. So how, how does your career then move kind of away from racing? Was it like, was video projects becoming more of a thing is that what sort of pulled you away from it or yeah so i mean i raced i raced at a high level i would say all through the 90s and early 2000 um but being like coming like born and raised on the north shore a lot of the sort of early um i guess document like filmmakers and photographers a lot of this terrain here was being documented um and so I was here, I was a rider and I was friends with all these, these crew. And so I got to kind of get on photo shoots and video shoots and that's kind of where it started. Um, and then bike magazine back in the day was sort of like the Holy grail of, um, I guess exposure for if you were a free ride athlete. Yeah. And so I worked with photographers, Sterling Lawrence, um, and some other, you know, like top photographers and, and we got exposure early days and bike mag really was a catalyst to sort of like these careers and for a lot of us so i sort of dabbled a little bit in, in that space through the 90s and then as i stopped racing i actually then went full in on the free ride side like rampage and and then really got to travel the world on photo and video shoots in the you know early mid like what up to 2010 2000 and in that area kind of or a time frame yeah so maybe yeah. not so much a sort of a conscious decision but like you were in the right place to fall towards doing more video work by yeah the time. i mean it, it was like yeah i think just being i you know i i was done with racing i for sure didn't want to race anymore i wanted to change um and again just the amount of film and production crews that were coming out of bc and the opportunities were there and so I was fortunate enough to be there at the right time and and work with my friends and yeah i mean looking back at the trips that we got to do and it was incredible you know yeah you were involved with um some of the early like anthill stuff right yeah yeah the collective collective and that was sort of where it all started with that crew and they're all friends of ours and of mine and collective and uh rome and seasons was sort of the trilogy so i got to um i got to go on numerous shoots with that whole crew yeah. yeah what was the response like to film back then compared to now maybe because it was it's kind of we live in a different world right like people were were waiting for yeah. content to drop whereas now we're just content just falls out of the internet yeah. into our phones it's it's really different yeah it's totally different yeah i mean those those you know those movies they got really hyped up and their premieres and they're like have the you know the the premiere would be in vancouver or whistler and there'd be like hundreds and hundreds of that you know people there and it'd be a big party and a big production and there'd be a lot of hype around it you know um so it it, it was entirely different and now um unfortunately that long form movie isn't is like well received you know um it's the quick edits it's what people i guess crave or want but there's more of it you know obviously yeah. the media landscape's totally changed and and so there's more of it and and so people kind of get um oh, what's the word i'm looking for they get 
numb, I guess, almost to the, to, to seeing all the content and the expectation of what you're going to see and how, you know, and, but, um, yeah, it's totally changed the, the old days of the movies and, and those premieres and all that is, is, uh, they were incredible and maybe they'll come back. I don't know. It'd be nice to see for sure. Yeah. So yeah, your, your free ride, like part of your career kind of took off. And like you say, you competed in some of the early rampage events. Yeah. What was it like uh, getting involved in that? Because that at the time as well was very, I guess, different from a a, a competition format to anything. Well, else. it was yeah, it was very raw and, and unproduced. I would say, you know, it was like, you know, it was um, obviously the it was in the same zone as where the current rampage are. I mean, it's always in that same zone in Virgin, whether it's on one side of the highway or the other side. There's 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 I mean that area down there is unbelievable, and we actually went down to that area. In the early prior to Rampage, we we filmed a movie called Ride to the Hills, and um, we did a segment down there on, on the on the first actual Rampage site the year prior. Um, yeah, it was with Dave Watson and Jordy Lund was with us, and yeah, it was um, it was it was incredible. But the 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 courses back then, you just had less time to dig. Obviously, it was way more natural. Um, for us, it felt gnarly because it was gnarly. Where obviously the equipment wasn't quite the same, but we were on decent equipment, but not the same. Um, so yeah, it was fun fun to be a part of fun in the early stages. Yeah, was it? I can't remember whether it was televised or not at that point. Like I can't remember how mm. we we consumed Rampage in the early days. That's a good question, actually. I don't know if it was televised. No, I think maybe it was just like videos afterwards and f- photo edits yeah. and stuff. But yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's a good question. Like Red Bull sponsored it, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't think it was like. Well, yeah, certainly it wasn't a live feed or anything. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. It was just your video and photo stuff. You know. Yeah, and yeah. you had a, a second place. Was it to Cedric? Yeah, I got second ride Cedric and. Uh, what year is that 2002 maybe 2002 uh-huh. is my first year actually on track yeah yeah and you weren't a young rider at that point right no. like you had a family already yeah our son ethan was born at that time yeah I, I mean my like my career wasn't i would say normal in terms of you know like racing early and then free ride stuff and i did a few rampage um i competed in a few i did well in that one and just the second there in 20 or 2002 sorry um and then you know i had a crack couple crashes and some other ones and that was then i kind of just started going a different direction and um still on shoots and still on video stuff but i would say taking less risk um then yeah i just wanted to kind of transition a little bit you know the sport was changing pretty quickly and then obviously with the introduction of slope style competition at all i mean the sport was completely going in a direction that i wasn't so when I was, it was totally good, good with it though. So yeah, was that yeah. was that want to reduce risk because you had a family? Was it because your body doesn't like heal as quickly as you? Get yeah, older? I think like, so. I think you just get to a point where you know, like I was in my early thirties there. I obviously had a good run. I you know I raced World Cup for ten years and did a bunch of stuff that, and and you know had some injuries, but nothing you know knock on wood too crazy and and felt felt good and like yeah i just wanted to just slow down slightly you know still still do it but just kind of take a little less risk you know and and also move on to some new sort of challenges work-wise as well yeah and so like you said that i think it was the year you came second to cedric you'd recently become involved with trek and that was through a meeting initially was it with john riley i think who's now head of mountain bike development there like, yeah how did that, you and trek come together yeah it was early days 2002 i think or no sorry he would have come to whistler we met in whistler in like 2001 and um at that time trek was didn't really have any presence at all in the i would say the free ride or the downhill sort of like product product wise anyways riley came to whistler we met through a mutual friend and then that's kind of how it connected and then i started with trek in 2002 and then sort of went on from there yeah and part of uh, like that change in in i guess lifestyle a little bit and other projects and and working with trek one of the things you put together was these gravity camps which you've been running in whistler 
for quite a long time now. Um, yeah. yeah, tell us a little bit about that, like where that idea comes from and why you wanted to, to go that way. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the bike park, I think, started and opened in 99, I think was the first year that was the bike park. Um, and then coming from a bit of a ski background, I was familiar with the ski camps, like the glacier ski camps where they'd have summer camps for for kids where you go skiing or snowboarding on the on the glacier. And so I kind of just modeled it after the ski camps. So it's like week long camps. You come in, we pick you up at the airport, get you to Whistler, get you in a hotel. And that's sort of where it started. And I wanted to, you know, try to be like the first to sort of do this, you know, and I obviously was still a pro athlete at that time. So I felt like I could use my connections within the industry and my partners and then like the other pro athletes and trying to get them to come up and coach. And so that's kind of really where it started, you know, and then it sort of tied in with those early days of C3, like, um, you know, starting the free ride program, like Trek as the sport changed, like I mentioned earlier and going in the free ride world, I, I, Trek, um, I was fortunate that they like sort of entrusted me to start hiring some athletes and, uh, um, yeah, definitely. I so, want to talk a bit about that before we move yeah. off the, the gravity camp yeah. stuff though. Like you had some big names through that over mm -hmm. the years. I think Finn Isles has been on the camps, Mark Wallace, maybe. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. Finn came, Finn, <laughs> Finn started tent. His mom and dad actually sent me an email and they're like, it was through another friend out there like, Hey, this kid really wants to come. Their parents are going to email you, but he's only 10. I'm like, yeah, we don't really like take 10 year olds. Cause he, at the time, um, it was 13 and up. Like you have to be able to stay in the camp hotel. We have counselors and make sure nobody's all the kids are acting well. And there's room checks and going to bed and all that kind of stuff. But anyways, I'm like, okay, well, they showed me a video of him riding and I'm like, okay, well, the kid is clearly of the talent to ride or to attend and whatnot so anyways he came uh and he attended with his brother jack yeah and i think i think finn was about nine or ten and jack was just a year or two older and finn came to the camp for like four or five years four years probably yeah and um you yeah, know we've had a bunch of kind of bigger i mean jackson goldstone came to camp for three four years um there's a bunch of kind of, I'd say, athletes and and then industry people now. Even like I think of like Paris Gore. Paris came to camp, you know, a photographer. Yeah. Paris attended. Kyle Jamison, Kyle Norbreton. Um, yeah, a bunch of bunch of people. That's awesome. So yeah. you've you've obviously seen a lot of young talent kind of come through the camp over the years. Mm -hmm. Are there common themes or like attributes to these kids that have made it? Like, do you see? It uh commonality or i mean obviously just based off the just the ability on a bike really you know um but no i wouldn't say like it's really just you know they all they're all been good kids they were all you know good kids is when they were young and they just they were just obviously very naturally gifted um and some make it some don't that's fine and um but yeah it's been it was cool to see in the early days some of the like I said, the Jacksons and the Finns attending SGC. Yeah. And you've had, I've been running this for what, 10, 15 years? No, longer. It started in 2002. So, whoa. 22 okay. years. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. have you seen, like, it feels to me like there's been a progression in the level of riding of younger kids, in, certainly in the last like five or 10 years. Yeah. I don't know if it's because like the bikes are better or maybe these kids are seeing. Like more of the riding than we ever did because they've got instant access to you know all the clips and stuff like do you, yeah have you i think seen i mean it, yeah i think i mean it's just a combination of things it's it's a it's access to train it's access to bike parks pump tracks dirt jumps you know it's all that you know and just as the sport progresses and then they see what's possible by the athletes it's it's just yeah i think it's just progression in sport in general you know um certainly from the early days of camp to now and that level of rider is way higher now you know, like the, the, the people that are coming in the attendees they're it's they're they have a much broader skill base than in the early days you know yeah so and we're seeing that at world cups i'd say like the these younger yeah. riders you know jackson and jordan are just part of that example mm -hmm. but i believe we've got some pretty rapid juniors 
like joining the circus this year and you know there's always people moving up and pushing things forward like it feels like the sport's progressing maybe even faster than it ever has from a like skill and talent perspective yeah oh yeah no the skill is phenomenal i mean some of the juniors are skill wise or you know close to the top senior elite no question it's just strength and race craft and experience but then the equipment side of things and what the athletes have the ability to ride and test and and the, yeah the whole spectrum suspension um is is unbelievable really yeah yeah it's well, insane eh? yeah you, you mentioned the c3 program for track mm-hmm. um yeah, can you tell us a bit about where that program came from in the first place? Because people might not might not be familiar with it. Yeah, I mean, so so you met, you know we talked about free ride in the early days and how it started off just more raw, natural, big mountain, and then as it started progressing into slope style and slope style and Whistler being, I think, the first contest. I think it was the first contest in the world in the slope style world, Joyride back in the. Yeah, the 2000s, maybe 2004 or five. I can't remember um, exactly, but seeing this sport evolve, um, I I kind of like you know conversation with the folks at Trek and just like, hey, we need to be at the forefront of this. Can we hire some athletes? And so that's kind of where it started. So again, they sort of entrusted me to sort of get the ball rolling. Um, Cam McCall was our first hire, and now he's going on 20 years of trek. And then Seminok was a couple years after, or a year after, when he was 14 or 15. And so then it kind of just kept going, and we've, we've been fortunate, you know, to, you know, identify great athletes and, and trek's commitment to the sport and... um yeah it's on it's an unbelievable run really when i look at it you know who's been riding our bikes and what the accomplishments that we've had along the way like the amount of slope style wins rampage wins film projects like it's yeah so it's it's been really fun to be a part of um i'm passionate about it so it i love it still i love watching i love being a part of it you know equally to the obviously the race side of things so yeah what does c3 mean something is it a random yeah it's like uh competition creativity cinematics was that's sort of where it started yeah makes sense now i don't know like c3 we don't we don't push the c3 brand i would say as much anymore it's really just the free ride lifestyle athletes but um yeah i think we were kind of the first well i think we were the first kind of company to really push that you know um that team environment um yeah and then obviously a meal or what a meal's doing on the slope style world is like unbelievable he's a machine yeah, yeah. and you've been the the, the sort of the, the talent scout i guess for that project yeah. is that fair yeah that's fair yeah yeah i mean i i've been able to like i said identify the talent and work with them and but it's more than just like uh, you know hiring an athlete and and let's see what happens it's like i truly sort of embed myself with what they're doing and try to help them in in any way we can and 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 as like a mentor as a you know just a friend just walk them through the because it's stressful you know it's stressful being a top level athlete and then dealing with sponsors and and all the distractions in your life so i try to help as much as i can not just like i said not like just like a typical sponsor i would say like or what you would think would be like you get a paycheck go perform like i truly work with our whole crew you know so um i think it just uh it only benefits all of us you know like the athletes the sponsors track you know shram the people that i work with it really just you you have the relationship side of thing and it, it only benefits all of us yeah what's yeah. Uh, what sort of stuff as a mentor like what sort of things do you work on with riders are there again are there common themes that most riders need some like guidance and learning on yeah i mean you know some more than others but it's just it's just boun- bouncing ideas you know whether it's a new sponsor that they're looking at outside of what we you know i do or it's like 
you know, like investment decisions, you know what I mean? Like being smart with your money. And like, I mean, I'm not a financial wizard or anything, but I have an idea and I'm, you know, about that world and just like where to, how to just be smart. It's not always going to last and, and whatever it is, you know, so it's just sort of help them as, as much as I can where I can. So, um, yeah, I think it's important to have that, like someone you can kind of trust that's, you know, looking out for you. So. Yeah, is that common in the mountain bike world? Like, I haven't really heard of people in that position before, like helping with, yeah, the life skills around being a pro mountain biker. Yeah, I um, I mean, I'm sure other people are doing it. Like, maybe agents, if you have an agent, if they're looking out for you in that world. But typically, agents, I wouldn't say totally go into that stuff. So maybe some do, but um, yeah, I don't know. I I just I look I don't look at it like we're we're sponsoring an athlete. It's like obviously it's a partnership. The athletes we're working together. Let's try to make this um just be successful for everybody, you know. So just not that it's just like a business transaction, you know. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. T- tell us a little bit then about um how you found Brandon Brandon Seminuk and like what drew you towards him yeah. as an individual to bring into the program. Well, I mean, I've told this story quite a few times, but um, the first time I saw Brandon, we were at the Dirt Jumps in Whistler, and he would have been 14, I think. And I was there with Ethan, our son, and Ethan would have been, I don't know how old he would have been, probably, well, Brandon was 14, Ethan's 22, Brandon's early 30s, I don't know, six? okay maybe something yeah. like that <laughs> i don't know anyways we we're at the dirt jumps and uh i went there a lot with ethan when he was younger and and uh brandon always seemed to be there when we were in whistler and i'm like who is this kid you know he's just like out there riding why is he in school uh was one of my first thoughts and then second i was like man he's really good and he's just like committed and he just puts his head down and does his thing. And so that's kind of where it started. Um, I saw him. He worked with a local bike shop in Worcester called Evolution. And um, I knew the owner of Evolution at that time. Anyways, I made the connection. I talked to Brad. I said, "Is can we? Can I get you some frames? Like, Can we figure this out? And uh, at that time, he was riding another company's frames. They weren't really doing anything for him. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be able to like have exposure to him by actually seeing him ride a fair bit because I was in Whistler so much. And so that's really how it started. Just float him a few frames when he was like 14 or 15. Yeah. Or four, is, it yeah. Hard to, yeah. is it hard to keep athletes like that? I would imagine someone like Brandon gets plenty of pretty healthy offers from other bike brands, but Trek seemed to do a good job of hanging on to these like standout talents. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it is hard to keep the best athletes in the world, you know, and it's sometimes it doesn't go in your, on your favor, but, um, I think again, you go back just to early conversation there, working with them beyond just like as a typical, like business, like this is a partnership, let's really work together. And so, yeah, I worked with Brandon a lot in the early days and, and still do, um, but in a different capacity, I'd say, but he you know he was an interesting kid like he was so driven and so determined and you know he looked at a very like okay i just got to do this 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 and so he um but that's the case with most of the i think most of the top athletes in the world they're so um they just have like not like one track but they're very focused on what they need to do and he was definitely like that and uh he's he used to be very shy um introverted i guess you still call him a little bit of an introvert but he's totally changed you know really just as he's matured and gotten older and whatever but yeah his career is something else like it's it's you look back at what he's done and achieved from when he was 15 to where he is now from the riding the competition the projects the driving now like it 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 truly is amazing his career um so for me to be a part of that and and be friends and try to help where i can with him has been like it's been a highlight for sure uh, yeah you could super... never expect it yeah i mean I, who would have predicted it you know <laughs> yeah, yeah it must be super rewarding when these these riders are putting out these incredible film projects yeah. and you can look at that and be like okay yeah 
all right i was i was part of this well i don't i don't know i mean i wasn't i mean certainly i'm not a part of his film projects i mean i guess i was a part of you know to some degree a part of it but not you know he what he does and his crew um filmers and builders do what they do is unbelievable but yeah to be have a little piece of you know being of what what he's achieved is is very cool and then that that goes for all the athletes i get to work with yeah what yeah. about emil how did uh how did you discover him it was in whistler he would have been 18 maybe again he was riding for a different brand and i just i just spoke to him um i know that at, at that time we had reader as well and but brandon was kind of moving away from competition um certainly slope style competition and reader was kind of on the uptick but then with brandon going away i was like oh it'd be great if we could have two athletes competing you know obviously the risk for injury in that sport is very high if somebody gets hurt you know we don't have anyone competing and so i just introduced myself and um and said hey we'd love to get you on track bikes if we if we can if there's an opportunity and just let me know and we can talk and then we just stayed in touch and i think within that next two three four months after that we 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 did a deal with them and so that's yeah, yeah i've been working with him yeah so whatever five years now six years yeah I'm probably wrong with the years and amount of time but it's in that it's in that range yeah and another one that's just taken off and like created. yeah it's just you you, you watch i don't know i mean yeah if you watch these athletes and the ones that are the bat you can there's something there that stands out about how they ride and how they approach it and to me it's like it's kind of the approach really like you have to have that natural you watch them do something and you're like okay, that's incredible but then it's the approach of how they do it and and watching them practice or watching it it can be very subtle but there's something there that i usually go with my gut instinct a little bit and some of it is very obvious and sometimes it's just like oh let's we got to try this you know yeah i guess yeah. a good element of it is their their character right their personality their their willingness to absolutely commit and just yeah practice and practice and practice and absolutely and have yeah. to drive for these things absolutely yeah they're very similar that way like brandon and and brett when we, when he was with us and, and emil the way they are determined and just perfectionists and how they approach their craft yeah yeah next level yeah and so in recent years you've uh been looking after the trek factory downhill program as mm -hmm. well um and one of the athletes within that Cade edwards has obviously recently made the announcement that he's moving from the factory downhill team into the c3 program yeah. which both your babies yeah um yeah what are your thoughts on that like it's i'm hoping it sounds like we might well still see Cade between the tapes at the occasional world cup which would be good because i think all the fans enjoy watching Cade on track yeah. but also cool for him to have freedom to do maybe more creative stuff as well yeah i mean kate is another one of those athletes it's just like incredibly talented you know but he rides his bike every day it doesn't doesn't come out of just like luck you know he's he works his butt off to try to be an incredible athlete and he is the racing thing for kate is he's you know you have to have a cer certain demeanor to succeed you know in racing and and like i don't think it's his natural um place really racing like he can he can go very fast and he can be one of the quickest guys on track at times but to do it from start to finish on race day under that pressure just like it's not totally his i guess natural environment we watch him ride on track and everybody's just like completely entertained right like we're gonna miss yeah. not <clears throat> excuse me we're gonna miss not having him at the races like for all of us you know the other athletes the media like what he does it's, it's like it's a highlight show but where he's going now with his career and filming and projects and 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 maybe the odd race or odd competition here and there that i think that's really suits him well um it's a big change it's a new challenge for him but you know like we're here to help him and and work with his partners and he's yeah he's a trek athlete and he's a you know shram rock shock athlete and so we're going to do our best to always look out for him um but yeah, what a what an incredible and like entertainer on a bike, eh? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like yeah. some of the World Cup footage over the last couple of years that the Sleeper Co guys have got, and like yeah, yeah. watching him on track in Leger last year was just wild. I guess it was an absolute no brainer to keep 
keep him with you know within the trek family oh yeah no i mean it was priority to keep him you know yeah i think one of his clips in um at one of the races this year where he knows manual to cross um a bridge apparently yeah, that's one know. of the um most watched clips was past racing it was like Cade <laughs> and knows manual across the bridge yeah no way yeah. and he was on a good run before that as well i think yeah. he had crashed didn't he yeah yeah yeah, no, he's Insane. a talented, he's a talented guy. He's unreal. He is for sure, man. So yeah, team manager for Trek Factory Downhill. Um, how would you describe what that means? Like, what does the team manager do? What's your role? How do you see so, your role? So, I mean, I'm not. I'm, first of all, I'm not the only manager. Another another guy that I work with, a close friend, is Ryan Gall. And Ryan, in all honesty, does a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, he works at Trek HQ in in Wisconsin. I live on the North Shore of Vancouver, so obviously what, but he does, he, he's dealing with mechanics and his, I would say his main role is equipment, you know, so mm-hmm. he's dealing with all the equipment and prototyping and ordering. And so again, he does a lot of that heavy lifting. Um, so there's things that I can't do that. And then vice, what I do for the program is more just, um, athlete relationship athlete development talent scout working with the team future athletes future kind of opportunities and so um a little bit of product working with partners and everything so it's we we kind of combine forces and it works out really well yeah Yeah. what what stuff do you think is like really important from your perspective to ensure that that team goes as well as it can once we get to race day right because there's a huge amount of stuff that goes behind the scenes but like in in the recipe as far as you're concerned what do you think is yeah is key i mean obviously the people are the most important We're trying to have the right people and obviously the athletes the athletes that are like committed and want to win races is number one um but good people as well we want to have people you know you don't want to have disruptive people on the program and we're traveling together as a big family for a long time, a long period of time, you know? Um, so you want to have good people, mechanics, staff, just create an environment that people are comfortable with. They want to be around people. I'd say that's like very important. And then the, on the performance side, just the, the prep that goes into it, the partners that we work with, um, what Trek puts into the program in terms of prototyping and working and always trying to like, progress and evolve i think having that support is really what makes a program successful the level of riding now is so high and the times are so close for wins or most of the time they are so you're you know you're battling for tents here and there so i would say that you can't leave sort of any detail uncovered um so i think I, mean, I think that's sort of the most important thing you know it's 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 you're always trying to like progress and try to get better at what what you do and we work with some of the best athletes and obviously with with loris the last few years he's pushed us to be better at what we do um the staff from track everybody our partners he's always pushing and trying to like progress his riding and the equipment so he keeps us on his toes which is good um so yeah hopefully that's answered your question <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah you've had a new shiny truck in the last couple of seasons as well like did you yeah, we were, say in that yeah we were fortunate to get that truck that got that got pushed through the budget just during COVID or just after so we we're fortunate to get that through the budget now i think we'd be looking at a different story we'd be still working out of the sprinters which are fine but we kind of grew the setup that we had so going to a bigger setup um you know with four athletes and the staff it's it's we're fortunate to have that the big rig it's definitely it's pro yeah it's yeah. pretty factory <laughs> it does look good yeah what um did did you have some say in like the interior layout of that thing because like i've had the opportunity to go in a few of the team trucks and everyone's kind of cut it a bit differently i guess some people are stuck with what they've got if they've bought an old truck off like a, a moto team or whatever but yeah did you build from the ground up with that? Yeah, it was built from the ground up. I, I had, to be honest, I had very little little input in the truck. Ryan Gull again, uh, and then a few other people, and then a couple of our mechanics had feedback, and they're the ones that that really laid did the did the plan and the the layout. I would say of the truck. 
Yeah. And has it changed things from a like a race week logistics point of view? Has it been a big like how big of an advantage do you think having infrastructure like that is? Um, well, I think it's just the ease of being able to like packing equipment in, packing things out, space for athletes, space for mechanics, space for gear. That is like it's huge. Um but then the flip side, you know, you have to have a dedicated driver, which we do. Dan Bladen is one of our mechanics as well as the is the lorry driver as well which is great um but yeah i think just set up and tear down is easier with the crew um but i think the biggest one is just having this space for for everybody um we're fortunate we have it and it's 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 really comfortable nice yeah. and do you think there's still room for like creating advantages for riders within team infrastructure like we're seeing more and more staff on teams we're seeing more and more people track side certainly that seems to be an area where there's been a lot of focus do you think there's still room to to give your riders a bit of a an advantage over others with with how you staff and what you do well certainly having staff on track and and is really critical um as you mentioned there's so many teams that have people up on track so that's not that's the norm now really everyone at least has one person sometimes two sometimes three on track um yeah i think you know I, in terms of like I, the truck and stuff like that i you know maybe there's a slight advantage that's not gonna really make the difference between you winning or losing a race um but i don't, I don't know i don't know if i answered your question there yeah yeah i guess i, guess, I don't know do you think there's still room Oh. for roles within teams that maybe other teams don't have like yeah. i think you know having a dedicated kind oh, yeah. of physio person seems to be becoming more of a thing certainly in the bigger budget teams like do you think that there are still advantages to be had if budgets were unlimited? oh for sure yeah no absolutely like we're fortunate we have an incredible massage therapist physio um I think the the big one is is probably again on the product and the suspension development and having like dedicated suspension tech and where some teams are now and um where it's going to go that's going to be the big one and we're okay. we're already seeing that in the sport um but I think the factory teams the ones that can afford or have the luxury of having that type of staff are going to be the ones that are always going to kind of stay at that top echelon similar to really in the motorsports world and um to a lesser degree but you know how they have suspension their own dedicated suspension tech maybe even per rider or per team or whatever but that's i don't know if we'll ever get to there it'll also hurt the sport to some degree too you know yeah yeah on the grassroots yeah. element but on the top end world cup down racing it's 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 gonna get we're going to keep kind of going in that direction to some degree. Yeah. And yeah. you've got a new rider joining the team this year, right? A rider that you helped out a little bit last season as well, I think. Yeah, Sasha. Um, I noticed her in Lenzerhide last year. Um, and at that time, we sort of knew that, that Valley was moving on and she was going to go do her own thing. And so we were looking around for potential female athletes. Um, and yeah, I was up on track. I, I, she rode by me two corners, literally I watched her ride two corners, didn't know who she was trying to find her on the start starting sheet. I was like, okay, <laughs> Sasha I looked at her and she definitely has a natural ability on the bike. And then unfortunately she got hurt that race. So she actually never raced. And I was like, oh, it's too bad. But I brought it up on, we, we have a weekly call with our marketing crew and teams in the race shop. And I was like, I brought up the, this athlete sasha i was like hey i really think that we need to look at her she's 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 quick and she's natural on a bike you know and then in um two weeks later i think it was val de sol mm -hmm. and i wasn't there i was in worcester actually my camp start so i i typically miss one world cup a year or two depending on that but uh ryan gall said ryan you got to meet sasha i'm gonna ask her to come through the tent i really want to make an introduction and just make sure she sees what's going on blah 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 anyway she turns out winning the race by a lot and so quickly everybody knew who sasha was <laughs> uh but yeah she's she's 
fresh. I mean, we're stoked we signed her. We helped her out last year with a little bit of equipment, just helped her out with a little bit of travel expenses. And, and now she's on the official team. And um, yeah, she's talent. She's young. She's very new, I would say, like still has a lot of room to improve with with technique and training and all that. But her like foundation is is really sound. Yeah. Second year junior this year, is that yeah. right? Second year okay. junior. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of talent in that uh, junior women's field. Hey, there's and more coming in this year. Absolutely, yeah, a lot, a lot of talent. Um, some Kiwi talent, a lot of time. There's, yeah, there's talent all over the world. But yeah, it's cool. It's really good to see in the female side. There's, um, I would say that's sort of somewhat new. Seeing these younger junior, you know, youth women that are really, really good on their bikes. It's phenomenal, really. Yeah, super good. Yeah. Uh, do you have any kind of involvement with the union at all? Because the union have moved over to Trek this year. Like, do yeah. you get involved with support from from that side at all? Yeah, 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 yeah. Joe Joe Bowman and I have become friends. He's a great guy. Um, but that program is is um, I would say sort of critical towards the development side for us. Um, the, he does a really good job with all his partners and his, the image of the program and, 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 but just the athletes that he's been able to attract and then keep, and then like, you know, move on. But I think for us, we sort of, we work with junior as well mm -hmm. and they've been great to work with, but a little bit different, I would say, and the union opportunity where some athletes that really wanted to stay there. And like Chris Hauser is one of them. The Italian kid is really quick. He's talented. Um, and so Joe's done an amazing job of like identifying talent. And so him and I have been able to, you know, with, with Santa Cruz, obviously not being able to support them. And we really kind of needed that, um, you know, development program. And so it's something that I, I mean, personally, I really push for with track and they were on board. And so, yeah, it's, we're, we're fortunate we were able to do it. Yeah, and two wins from Crankworks last week. Yeah, the weekend. Man, it's not a bad start. Ellie and Lockie are all an ass. Yeah, they're locals, and they were. I mean, you can see by their runs. I don't know if you watched the race, but they were like, they were not going to lose. You know, that's the way. <laughs> that's the way the race um, runs looked like. They were. They were charging. Yeah, no, I'm excited. Yeah. It's going to be, no doubt, another awesome season. I mean, you've been involved in downhill racing on and off in some capacity, whether it's as a rider, a manager, or mm -hmm. you know, a fan for a long time and it certainly had its ups and downs like how how do you feel it's evolved from those i guess early 90s days when you started to where we're at now because there's a lot of change but yeah of i mean there, i mean there's so much change obviously the athlete development how they train the access to trainers um the equipment uh what we started racing on and what the athletes are on now or you know is like night you can't compare it really um and then the lever things just kind of gotten a little more professional obviously you know just i mean back in the uh, mid 90s though like the grunde was it was the grunde words so i think grunde was mm -hmm. the sponsor there for a while and, like there was money and there was press and there was you know it was on tv it was on Eurosport, so it was definitely like prevalent but i think now it's just it's you know again it's just kind of a notch up and the teams have become more professional and it's just sort of just a gradual sort of progression i would say yeah yeah and we're, we're heading into the second year with warner brothers discovery mm -hmm. at the helm like how do you feel that's going both from like your role as a team manager but also as a, i guess as a diehard downhill fan like do you think we're heading in a, in a good direction with that stuff yeah i think so i mean i think there's still some questions that will need to be answered a little bit as we go forward um how many races will we seize in the future what's the ideal number of races for for athletes and staff and everybody and, and you know being able to support it financially and everything it's not a cheap sport now to travel the world with the team and have the athletes and um but the fact that it's attracting and we're on non-endemic media um is is huge for the sport so I think we're early stages. We'll see what happens and see what how that progresses. But um, I don't I, personally. I don't see how that could hurt us. You know, um, whether the fields will stay the same, like the the, the size of the fields, like it's mm -hmm. it's it's obviously very um, cost prohibitive from a grassroots standpoint. Privateer, it's really getting tough. 
So I think you're going to see changes there, which is we've already seen that this year. Um, but then hopefully there'll be a, a series below that will really support that level of rider that's not quite at World Cup or doesn't have quite that backing yet where they can really like, you know, progress or get better or whatever and, and get it, um, experience and then make the jump up, you know, because it's yeah. really right now it's most people can, you can enter a World Cup if you have some points or wherever it's, it's, it's not. So it's, it's the field, I think, to some degree should be a little smaller um, at the top end. But yeah, early days, I would say we're hopeful that it's just going to keep progressing. I've used that word a lot in this interview. But <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you think we'll start to see more money coming in from non-bike industry brands? Like that's definitely like you look at Trek road teams, we yeah. see that happening. But do you think we're getting closer to that in yeah. mountain biking? Well, I think we're we're almost going to need it as we get you know what i mean certainly again if there's more races um more support more staff you know the athlete salaries aren't going down um so if we are to expand we are probably going to have to lean on non-endemic money and support because we need more money than there kind of is within the bike industry yeah to, to yeah fund not to just heading. yeah just not to lean on the the in industry or the industry brands or the industry companies whatever i mean obviously it's it's not easy times right now in the bike industry so personally i think for us to try to grow or even stay at the same level i think we'll have to lean on that a little bit yeah and you have some non-industry brands like involved with the team i think don't you uh on a small scale maybe small scale on the mountain bike yeah. side but nothing significant yeah yeah interesting yeah. be good to see that yeah hopefully that will change in uh in the future man yeah well i'm uh even more excited for the season to start than i was before we had this conversation i can't yeah. wait to get some more racing under our belt um before we wrap up we've got our final four questions that we've asked everyone over the years so we'll hit those up quickly yeah the first of those if our listeners had 150 pounds which i think is about 260 canadian dollars to spend on improving their performance on a bike what would you recommend they go and spend it on? So you go, just so I'm clear, you've got 260 Canadian. Yeah. To buy a product that's going to help you improve. Could be a product, could be a service, could be, yeah, anything that you think would help people get better on their bike. 260 bucks. Not much. Mm -hmm. Depend on the level of rider, but I would say a couple hours of coaching. Yeah. That'd be one. Yeah. Um, again, that really depended on what level of World Cup. Okay, it's different. Uh, but if you're an intermediate or you're new to the sport, a couple hours of coaching would do you a ton of good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good answer. Like it. All right. Next yeah. one. If you could wind back the clock and sit down with yourself age 16, which I guess was when you were just starting to get into mountain biking. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give? 16 year old andrew um you know just follow your follow the passion follow why you're doing it why you started it don't listen to the detractors like just follow what you feel you can do along the way you're always going to be told you can't do this or you can't do that or why don't you do this or you should do that which we should never say should to people right implying you should do it you think they should do um so i would just just follow your yeah follow your heart follow your passion and i think it will work out yeah have you ever been tempted to, to kind of move away from mountain bike related things as a career or once you were in you were in um i think at times i've always like should i try something else you know like a different challenge i've been in the bike world since i've been 19. i'll be 53 here in a couple months um so I've been in it like my whole life, really, you know, my whole adult life. So for sure, I think like, what if, if I tried this, but, you know, I think what always keeps me here is I really, like, I really love it. I love the sport. I love the, I'm passionate about it. So it makes it easy to be involved. I try to stay sharp and relevant within my space. Um, I like the business side of it too. I, 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 I feel like I have a decent business sense on things. So I'd like that 
that aspect of it. Um, but yeah, I think for me, it just, it doesn't always feel like work. So I, I still, I still enjoy it so much. Yeah. That's a good place to be, yeah. man. All yeah. right. Third one. If you could have a coaching session from anyone past or present, who would it be? And what would you want to learn from them? And this could be a riding coach. It could be something completely different. Past or present. I think, it, I think it would have been pretty cool to have been coached by Nico Julio's back in the nineties for a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i reckon you could have learned a bit eh? i could have learned a little bit just like what is this guy doing you know he was ahead of his time uh the way he raced the way he probably trained i don't know his training but just and the his knowledge of, of bike setup and all that and, and the exposure that he had to good people around him with that i think was probably well for sure a step or two ahead of everybody um yeah cer it's certainly a myself while to get back to that level i think like I think most people now are sort of at the level of yeah. work that Nico was doing then, but that's yeah. 20 years ago, right? Yeah, he was ahead of his time really for that. So that would have been pretty cool to be like, have a little bit of time and see how his world worked. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Good one, man. Uh, last one then, something that you do every day that you feel benefits you? I do every day that benefits me. Um I like walking downstairs and turning on my nice coffee machine. I look <laughs> at it, it makes me happy. <laughs> I know it's very, I know that's kind of a ridiculous thing to say, but when I'm at home, I appreciate so much being able to have a nice coffee and I don't take it for granted that I have this nice machine in my house. Um, that's on a very basic level. I appreciate my family and friends, obviously. Um, being able to be active, I appreciate that. Like, we're fortunate where we are. We can, I can go ride my bike out my back door here and be in trails for hours. And so I never take that for granted. And I'm, you know, I truly still love to ride my bike. And, you know, yeah. That's cool, man. What yeah. bikes get in the most use in your garage? Um I've been riding the new slash a lot, the high pivot mm -hmm. slash a ton, the EX, I ride a fair bit. Um, so it's kind of those combo, a little bit of e-bike stuff in there. So it's yeah. kind of a you're still doing product development work as well for track i do a little bit yeah um it's kind of slowed down i'd say with more of my involvement with with track factory racing over the years and then covid and travel everything kind of affected but yeah. now sort of getting looped back in on some projects and um yeah so still still involved and and yeah. love that and side of things are there certain areas that you tend to specialize in? Like, are there, is it, a, you know, you're the kinematic person that they send a bike to to check that stuff? Um, I mean, certainly I'm not pushing the equipment like I used to. Uh -huh. I still feel like I ride at a decent level, but I'm not, yeah, I'm not charging by any means. Uh -huh. But I think I have a pretty good feel for what a bike does or doesn't do or how it should feel. So I'd say that's sort of my strengths. Um, how you sit in the bike, how it feels. So that's sort of, you know, feedback and that I'd say I have a, a, a decent feel for. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Sounds yeah. like a fun job to me, man. Yeah. Well, it's been fun chatting. I'm looking forward to a season ahead. I hope all the riders in all the Trek programs go well. Um, if people want to check out what the downhill team's up to or what the C3 athletes are up to, where are the best places for them to be looking? Yeah. I mean, Trek Factory Racing is, is, is the, you know, like the social channels. Um, c32 i mean most i mean the athletes own their own social channels are huge with with brandon and emil and you know our dog all that casey the, you know they all have their own social followings um and then yeah if you have the ability to watch them racing on tv wherever that is in europe or in canada or north america i think it's now we've just been shown us on flow sports now in canada mm, so I saw that yeah so i think that i mean the racing is going to be another amazing year so yeah nice one man it's yeah. been a pleasure uh, yeah have a fun season and uh we'll see you trackside at some of the races nice thank you chris appreciate nice it one. Okay. thanks andrew ciao